Uh, okay, as I introduced this morning, um, for the New Users Day, there's there's a lot that can go into a New Users Day, uh, New User level talks. And as a, a, on my aside before lunch, I mentioned how expansive software radio is as a as a platform as a concept. Uh, so I'm I'm looking at this, hoping that this maybe become a series. So year after year, we we have different levels of talks on intro to VSP. Uh, so we've asked Jeff here to come and give a talk on uh, intro to sampling theory. So this might be uh, you know, well known to some people who have been doing comms for a while, been doing information theory, um, but it is a very fundamentally important topic in all of it, its impacts on software radio. Uh, so I think he's going to we'll get an introduction to that and some, some different looks at this concept. So, Jeff? Okay. Uh, Mike? Uh, yes, Mike. Uh, yeah, I, this is the fourth conference I've been to, and I haven't uh, been up on stage, so I think Tom wanted me to be useful for change. Either that, or he wanted to see what I'd do getting an intro of DSP talk to John Cola. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jeff Long, and uh, I've been working with Video Radio for a while. I own uh, NS USRP1, number, uh, serial number 411, and I try to buy or preferably get my company to buy every kind of SDR they can find. Um, but mostly I'm just a hacker. Um, so what is sampling? Well, sampling is uh, taking a small amount of something and using it to represent the whole thing. And that has some implications. Um, you have to admit that you can't take the whole thing. You have to figure out what you do take. And then it has to be for a specific purpose. So uh, you know, we're, we're not trying to digitize the world and uh, record it to a file. We're trying to do something specific. So you'll see this diagram a bunch of times today. I'm not really going to go over the uh, the architecture a lot, but uh, you'll notice that you've got a front end, um, oops, what there. Um, and that's the analog section. Um, and uh, there'll be talk later about that. Coming out of the front end, you've got one or more uh, lines of analog data. And you'll notice a lot of SDRs have multiple lines, and there's a reason for that. We'll touch on them here, but it's expensive for the hardware manufacturers to get multiple, um, almost identical lines out of the hardware, so you can tell it's important for your products. We've got the digital domain, and that's where we're interested. I mean, enough that transition from the analog to the digital domain happens at the analog to digital converter. And I'm only going to be talking about RX. The, the uh, transmit portion is similar, but uh, just for simplicity, we'll talk about receive. There's the data section, so the new radio can handle uh, can get all the way to packets. And so the sampling theory does not really apply to packets. You can sample packets if you want. But this is not about the blocks that handle the data. And then there's a control, I won't call it a control plane, but there's a control portion. And we're also not going to really talk about that. As I mentioned, uh, there are multiple uh, paths, uh, simultaneous paths through the box. So a little bit about the characteristics. Uh, analog signals. Uh, can be uh, radio frequency over the air, uh, or they can be baseband, which is typically what we put into the analog to digitally convert. As we heard a little bit earlier, the ADCs and the radios are almost getting to the point where you can put the radio frequency directly into the converter. So some of the ideas that we have with down conversion don't necessarily uh, hold in the future, but for right now, they do for the most part. Analog signals are continuous. If you measure them, say it's a voltage at any given time, then you'll get an answer. And they're real. You hear a lot about complex signals. Uh, there are no complex signals over the air. That's a, a concept we use to represent uh, ways of putting more information or different kinds of information over the air. Digital signals, on the other hand, are meant to represent the analog signals. Um, they're discrete. We can't have the digital signal at any Time. We, we typically uh, have evenly spaced times when we take a measurement. And um, just a point, you've heard a little bit about buffers. Uh, don't think that samples just fly through a system individually. That's sort of inefficient. So whenever you think about samples moving from one place to another, they're generally moving on a bunch of friends. So uh, I was trying to think how to present this, and I didn't want to do anything to do with math, and I wanted just concepts. Uh, so the concept I'm going to use has nothing to do with signals. Uh, I wanted a system that uh, could just represent something uh, very simple. So we're going to deal with linear motion. 
this robot is one of these that you wind up and it goes to a wall, hits the wall, turns around, comes back. Um, it runs at a constant speed. And uh, fairly importantly, we know exactly what time we set the thing off. You don't know this in real systems usually, but we're going to make that uh, assumption for right now. So in the signal domain, this would be a sawtooth wave. It's a periodic signal. And we're saying we have synchronous clocking, meaning that we know when we're expecting things to happen. So this is what, if we plot the position of the robot on the floor, draw a line right down the middle, and plot it over time, that's what it would look like. That's the sawtooth wave. And then we pick what is going to be the, the uh, time, let's say we're doing this for the camera, when we're going to take snapshots of where that robot is. The sampling time is the time between your snapshots. And here we have a periodic signal. So you can see that every four snapshots, the device will be back where it started. So our uh, signal uh, time is four times our sampling time, or our sampling frequency is four times our uh, signal frequency. Then we digitize. We, we say, OK, we've got just individual snapshots, and we record a vector array of where uh, we take our observation at each one of those times. And that's what you're dealing with in sampling. So that one, zero, minus one, that's the data that's going to go to the rest of the program. You'll hear about the Nyquist rate a lot. Um, it, it's kind of stated as more of a specific rule than it really is. Um, and a lot of times people think that if you sample a signal at two times the frequency of the signal, and you can represent it perfectly. That's not really it. What it, what it, it you should read it backwards. Um, if you are sampling at a certain frequency, there is no way you can represent any signal that has a frequency higher than half that frequency. That's probably a better way of thinking about it. Um, so sampling ratio, I actually couldn't find this term because there are terms for oversampling and undersampling, and I couldn't find any term for just how fast you sample. But that may have just been a Google problem. Um, and uh, we're interested in the maximum signal frequency, which is equivalent to the minimum signal period when we talk about the, the uh, ratio of the sample, the, uh, sample frequency. So uh, oversampling is when you sample significantly faster than the period of the signal that you're sampling. In this case, we're doing four times sampling. You can see that every fourth sample, the signal goes back to came from. Um, let's drop out a couple of these and do only two times sampling. So you can see that in this case, with the knowledge we have of the system and the way we've set it up, that that actually is sufficient. But one of the things I said in how we're going to set up the signal is why this is uh, going to work. And um, for that, you can see that it doesn't work so well if we do one time sampling and you think that it's just sitting still. That's the effect if you watch uh, on TV hubcaps of cars going backwards. It's called aliasing, and um, you, know, you can picture it visually. visually. The same thing happens with signals. Uh, GNU Radio, I just wanted to say, yes, we are still at the GNU Radio conference. You can do the same thing uh, in GNU Radio to show uh, this exact effect. Here, I just made a sawtooth wave to set it up so that it was sampling it synchronously. And uh, four times, or eight times, four times, two times, one times you get the same answer. Okay. So we assumed that we knew exactly when this device started moving. But what if we didn't, and we sampled exactly the wrong place? And you can see, this is why you can't just say sample at two times the frequency, because uh, you might get this answer. Um, so, that, so two times sampling can represent the frequency, but it can't represent the phase or the time something starts. And uh, in a little bit, I'll show how we can actually use that information to our advantage, because uh, time is information. Well, I, maybe time itself is too much of a statement, but the time the signal starts is information. So what can we do with that? We can grab two toys and start them at different times. And I'm going to and I'm going to uh, say that one of them is going to move a shorter distance. That's just so that they don't look the same on the graph but it still takes the same time to get back and forth. So plot the path in the first one, and plot the path in the second one. What you'll notice here is that when one of the devices hits the end, the other one is right in the middle. So um, 
we can actually add up the location of these two devices and turn them into one signal. And it's still not ambiguous which one was where and when, because we know when we were sampling each one and what the phase was. Uh, so this effectively is quadrature. We've taken two orthogonal signals. In this case, orthogonal just means two things that don't interfere with each other or where you can combine them and then back, them, back out to get the original answer. So we've got the signal in phase and quadrature, and this is effectively a complex signal. So you notice that I didn't use any complex math until I put up the equation here. It's the same concept. So the math is used to uh, make the computation easier, but it's not the concept. Um, a lot of times, if you have more time, you teach uh, complex math first, and then try to visualize a, a periodic signal as a spiral coming out of the graph. But you have to take the time to learn the math first, and that was enough to fit into. If you're doing quadrature sampling or complex sampling, we have twice as much information. We need twice the sampling rate. So there's, there's no free lunch. The reason, well, there is today, but, but not in the same process. The reason, I'll make some more. OK, so communication is really, though, based on sine waves, so enough of Wally. And um, so I wrote this down, and then I'm thinking, why? And actually, I did this before I heard a couple of talks this morning. Um, so the why is, one, the hardware guys with the filters. And uh, now I, I went to school for hardware guys. I'm mostly software guys. So I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to make fun of the hardware guys. So if they just get their filters in order, we won't be all set. Um, and then the second, as one of the other speakers said, is uh, regulatory. We had to divide up our resources somehow. And so our resources, uh, the airwaves, are divided up by frequency. Um, so we just keep going that way. But it's not necessary to use sine waves. We use other orthogonal functions like uh, code division multiplexing, time division multiplexing. We don't have to do just frequency division. And uh, LTE, for example, uh, tries to do all of those at the same time to some extent. Um, well, what I was really going to show before I got off on that subject is that sine and cosine are the same function and that they are shifted by 90 degrees. So these two signals, like the other ones I showed were simple, are shifted in time and they're orthogonal. I didn't want to try to prove that they were orthogonal uh, with sine and cosine here, but they are. If you add those two together and scale them, you get another sine wave. And it just happens that its phase is right between the first two. So you can see that you can use a sine and a cosine, two sines shifted by 90 degrees, to create another sine that is at any phase along there. So that's the information uh, that we get by having two channels. If you look at these in frequency, and the, so this is a, a plot of an FFT using the radio, you notice that all three of these waves come out of exactly the same frequency. We can't tell them apart. But it turns out that the Fourier transform, or the FFT, also gives us phase. Um, it's a little hard to read phase diagrams, but the parts I've circled I uh, show you that the three phases of these signals are spaced evenly, and that the red one is between the blue and the green one, which is the same thing that the graph shows. Um, sine waves add in both, the, obviously, in the time domain, but they also add in the frequency domain. So I took an A major chord here and uh, put four waves together and made up a little GUI in good radio uh, to be able to change the fourth frequency. So a uh, nice A major chord. Uh, this one didn't sound too good, so I decided not to play these things here. Um, and what happens now I'm sampling at uh, 4 kilohertz. So by uh, using the Nyquist rate, I can represent all the way up to 2 kilohertz in signal. What happens if I try to play something into this that uh, stops within that? So 3120. And it turns out that what I get is my nice A major chord back. So how did that happen? It turns out that uh, you can't represent frequencies, you can't reconstruct exactly the same thing um, if you sample at uh, less than two times the Nyquist rate, or at less than the Nyquist rate. Um, but you can still see the results. And just like those hubcaps that go backwards in video pictures, this signal went backwards in the Fourier transform. 
and got reflected down. So you need to keep this in mind when you're doing uh, SDR, because it's so easy just to slap a bunch of blocks together. So, so for us, people would think software more often than hardware now. Just, you know, yeah, drag a bunch of blocks together and make a flowgraph. Um, but there are some effects you have to keep in mind. This is just another demo of the same thing. Uh, you can see, uh, it's kind of interesting the way this is not looking like it's walking. The, the middle one is the frequency that's going into uh, a, um, a block that divides the sampling frequency by two, and the bottom one is what's coming out of that. And so I got an answer, but it wasn't the right answer, it was an alias answer. Uh, another thing to think about uh, with aliasing, you're not just trying to get other unwanted signals out of the way, you're trying to get noise out of the way. Um, if you uh, accept all of the noise that's above your Nyquist rate, it gets folded right down on top of the noise uh, that you're already trying to deal with. So, Downsampling is uh, the same as decimation, but with filtering. And that's the important difference between decimation and downsampling. So this uh, flow graph, uh, made on a computer with way too high resolution display, and you see it lay it out too well. Um, but I, I've got a look at uh, one path going through, can I point on this thing? No. So I've got one, uh, the original input, I've got uh, an output that goes through just a decimator here. And then I've got another output that goes through a low-pass filter and a decimator. Now, blue radio, typically, the decimation and the filtering goes together because uh, it's more efficient. But right? here I did them out separately. And what you get on the input, you can see the two signal sources that I put in into the adder uh, both show up. When I decimate them, the, uh, the blue graph shows, let's see, now the you know, blue graph shows that both of these uh, frequencies come out. Uh, one of them correct, and one of them alias down. The, uh, I should point it out here, the, uh, I was putting a 1.5 kilohertz wave uh, in, and we're originally at uh, 4,000 samples per second, and we're trying to read it out at 2,000 samples per second. Uh, so that gets folded back down here. The, the filtered version, the red path, uh, does not have that. So that's why you use a filter when you're downsampling. Same thing happens when you upsample. So here I'm just taking a 440 hertz input wave, and upsampling is just repeating. So this repeat block just takes each sample and repeats it twice. So that doubles the sample rate. There was originally 4 kilohertz, and then I'm reading it out at 8 kilohertz. If I take one path, directly into the frequency sink, and another path and put it through a low-pass filter. And you see a similar thing. So this is the input. On the output, we're seeing all the way up to 4 kilohertz, but in the unfiltered path, we have this extra unwanted spike out here at 3.5 kilohertz. So both with upsampling and with downsampling, you don't just decimate or repeat. You have to have kind of filter and get the correct answer. OK, different subject. Um, clocking. Uh, new radio doesn't have its own clock. Uh, there's an exception to this, as you saw in uh, Martin's talk. Devices, however, have clocks. They, they have to sample at a certain rate. So your USRP, your RTI, your audio card, all these things have built-in clocks. And uh, so if you have two people with two different clocks and you're trying to coordinate things, like, it's difficult. Um, same thing happens with SDR hardware. Even if you intend them to have the same clock, there could be frequency tolerances, and um, even if they're perfectly, uh, even if they have perfectly the same frequency, they aren't synced. You don't know them when they start. So here's an example. We take a signal source, we put it through a throttle. The reason we're using the throttle is so we don't blow up our computer, uh, and then we're putting that to an audio sync. But I made a mistake here. I've got two blocks that have clocking in them. There's no clock in the signal source. That's purely software. And the processor clock is used for throttling. It's actually a sleep call uh, inside the block, and it lets blocks through at, a, at the average pace that you specify. But that's based on the processor clock. And then the audio card has a clock. 
So there's going to be a conflict here. And so we're going to have to pick one. The good thing with audio is that they thought of this pro uh, problem a long time ago because people are sick to listening to their, you know, their audio sound like that. And so uh, there are resamplers in uh, some audio drivers. Also, plug HW is an important thing to remember. If your audio is having problems, then look that up and try to plug that in. So this is an example of uh, a bad flow graph that could have two clock in domains. But as I pointed out, it depends on what you use for, for your ALSA driver. It could be a good one. This one is going to always be bad. Taking an RTL and trying to make an FM repeater out of an RTL input and the USRP output. Uh, it's a great fun to have all those devices, but you're either going to end up with the ooh or the ooh. Kind of slightly differently. And one of them means that you've got an overrun, and one means you have an underrun. They both mean almost always that, uh, well, it could mean two things. You've either got a clock mess up, um, or you're trying to uh, run your computer way too fast, and uh, so you've got uh, just overflow through the processing. <laughs> These are both good. Uh, RTL FDR source uh, is the uh, controlling clock here. File sync doesn't care. It just does best effort. And the other way, we've got a signal source that's just a software construct. It does best effort into an audio sync, which controls the clock. So these bother a lot of people when they're getting started with computer radio because we don't have anything that says what domain or clocking domain different things are in. But if you just think of think of it this way, that you only want one device controlling your clock, you'll have a lot of problems. Quick talk about buffering. I'm not going to talk a lot about the internal Supreme radio. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, but just so you understand what's happening with the samples, uh, I've left out a couple of details here between the ABC and the radio block. But um, we don't have, uh, we, we don't handle just one sample at a time because it's slow. It's, it's not because we can't do it. Um, I think I was uh, reading something that you wrote up on the site about comparison to uh, one way that MATLAB works, or the frames. Or so somebody had written that up, that there's a, there's a mode that some systems work in where a single sample goes through the time. And maybe if you're trying to, um, to simulate something, you want to do that. But if you're trying to get performance out of your processing, you almost never want to do that. Um, it turns out that a lot of blocks require a history anyways, because we're not just dealing with one sample at a time. If we were just squaring every sample, we could do that. But uh, filters require a number of samples. FFTs and other operations that are used heavily um, require entire blocks. And uh, SIMD optimization, uh, if to do multiple things at the same time, it needs multiple things at the same time. So we're going to add buffers. Uh, buffer fills up. Uh, it's not quite the way it works, but we have a talk on scheduler, right? OK, we'll talk about that during the scheduler talk. Um, and uh, so block acts on a bunch of samples at a time, passing from one buffer to another. This increases the performance, but another important thing is that it increases the latency. You see this with audio cards all the time. Sometimes you'll see a setting for latency, how many audio samples you want at a time. And that relates to how good the playback is, but also relates to the time from when you talk to the time from when you hear yourself. Um, another thing buffering does is a bad thing. Uh, your flow graph will work for a short period of time, and everything's fine, and all of a sudden you get ooh or ooh. And um, almost always that's because the buffer has hidden the fact that you've got uh, mismatching clocks. Um, and about the only thing I want to show here is that the buffers are actually attached as the output of each block. And Multiple other blocks can read from, from we, we haven't had a whole lot of new radio examples yet, but the output of one block can go to multiple other blocks, and, um, and it's done through this buffering system. So we talked about the horizontal time, a little bit of sampling, and now a little bit on controlling the vertical. So this signal right here has got a problem. It goes way off the top of our graph. Yes, go ahead. The buffer is generally built in the block itself. It's hidden from it, though. But there will be a whole talk on that. So, um, so what are we going to get? We're going to get clipping. 
And you know what clipping sounds like? That's when you drive audio into something and can't handle it. It sounds really bad. Um, usually, you're used to hearing because of voltage limits in a signal. It's too high, and your analog circuitry is clipping. It just physically can't go to a higher voltage. Um, in SDR, we can also have uh, analog to digital converter settings that just by convention we say it's more than a volt. I don't want to hear about it. Uh, we've got representation limits. So once we've converted this to the digital domain, we carry the samples around in computer types. And those types may not be able to go above a maximum value. And the space between the levels that those types can represent may be um, not what you need. I'll show you a couple examples of that. So we try to set up an input signal so that we're trading off headroom, that means that if your signal gets louder, you won't clip, versus resolution. So uh, I have a little bit of quantization noise in any system. It may not be enough that it matters. If it's down low enough, nobody will ever notice. But let's say that I either have a lower signal or the spaces between the levels I can represent in whatever type I have uh, grow, then I end up with a lot of quantization noise. If you ever have a system where you just have a whole lot of noise, you'd, say, you'd be surprised how few bits uh, you have in some of your flow graphs if you ever really look. Um, but if you ever have a system where there just seems to be way too much noise, go look at the actual values. Maybe you're only seeing a couple of different levels that is hidden from you. To some extent, you can trade off oversampling and resolution. Um, if you add one more bit of resolution, that's the equivalent of two times oversampling. Um, but the details of this are something you probably want to read up on because it assumes certain characteristics of the noise. But it's the same idea as um, taking a, uh, a longer snapshot on a digital camera gives you a clearer uh, picture. It's pretty much the same idea. Sample types in good radio. Uh, a lot of blocks have multiple sample types, and you can pick what sample type you're going to work with. They're from GRC, there's a help menu, and uh, new radio is perhaps not for the colorblind because some of these colors look very similar, but uh, it gives you a list of what the different types are. We don't use all of these types all that much. The typical ones are floats. Float gives you about 23 bits of resolution, which is a lot, that's enough. Uh, to represent signals with a noise floor of 130 to 140 dB, which is almost nothing. Uh, a complex, you'll see, is just two flows. It's that in phase and quadrature carried around together to make math more convenient for some of the blocks. An integer, uh, you'll see this with the RT do RTL dongle or a hack RF. They only output in bits. It's perfectly usable. Uh, you have to keep track of what that means for your dynamic range. And it means that you have to get your levels a little bit better. 16-bit um, is what you would get out of the S boxes for the most part. There are some other modes. 32-bit, the only time I've ever seen 32-bit in a flow graph is to carry one bit of information, like for a gate. And so <laughs> that's kind of an oddball I mentioned. Uh, and all of these one bit is used for signs, so keep in mind that uh, I'll probably get from minus 127 to 127 about. When you convert between them, uh, you have to keep in mind what the different types can do. So a float uh, has 23 bits of anticipation, 23 bits of range, um, but it can scale to pretty much any useful value that represents anything that we know about. It's often on a scale between uh, minus 1 and plus 1. The sign types have a fixed range and fixed quantization between them. Um, integer probably handles more than we're going to need uh, for a while. And even 16-bit um, int will handle uh, quite a bit. That's uh, about 91, 90 something. When you do conversions, you have to be careful with the ranges. So here, the problem is that I, I have a full uh, height amplitude output off of my signal source. Uh, 32K, and I'm putting that and converting that to a float, which is perfectly valid, and I'm putting that into an audio sync, which is expecting between minus one and one, or even lower usually. Uh, so that's going to sound really bad. So you would want to put a scaling factor in here, and these conversions come with a scaling factor. 
So if your signals seem totally screwed up, see if your scaling is correct. Going the other way, I've got an audio source uh, coming in with a signal that's between minus one and one. I can convert it, that's perfectly valid. And I can put that into a file that's represented by shorts. And at most, I'll get one bit of uh, transition. Sometimes, not even any. So again, if you don't seem to have any signal, then take a look and see if you have a scaling problem. Uh, and then one final thing uh, on sampling is that sampling doesn't really happen at an exact time. Um, if it did happen at an exact time, you'd get the alias all the way up to gamma ray, and uh, you'd have to deal with all that noise and filter out. Um, and, uh, but we can't do that. Uh, in reality, we've got capacitance in analog circuitry and in the ABCs themselves. And uh, so you're really looking at the average of the signal over a certain amount of time. There's actually a type of distortion that's introduced as well. So what is the right rate to sample at? Um, a lot of times you say that this box will do 100 mega samples per second. So I take it 100 mega samples per second and then run it from a flow graph. Um, maybe that's not the right rate for your problem. Um, so some more concrete rules. For a real signal, like an audio signal, at least two times the max signal frequency. For audio, <coughs> two times actually works because the filtering takes out, you're, you're not actually seeing the whole, uh, like, like for a CD, you go up to 44.1 kilohertz, but the audio signal is off around 19 or 20, so, so it's already going to take that care of for you. For quadrature, at least four times. Uh, make sure you account for filter roll-off, because your signal doesn't just go right up to the wall, your signal's got a, uh, you real filters, which have roll-off. Um, you can oversample to reduce noise. Um, or to uh, relax the filter quality requirements. When you hear people talking about one bit sampling and advertising that, uh, for CD players, they used to advertise one bit sampling all the time. What they really meant is that we're too cheap to buy good filters, and so we're going to advertise the fact that we're using the sampling technique uh, so we can buy cheap filters. Um, aliasing might be desired. Some people uh, have done some really neat things with aliasing. For example, with um, the USRP1, you can receive FM stations even when you can only sample, uh, it's only sampling at uh, 64 megahertz. And that's because you're aliasing FM down. As long as there's nothing else that, that waves right over what you're looking for, then you can actually use that. Uh, Mike Austin and uh, Dominic Spill came up with a, a neat way of looking at Bluetooth by aliasing uh, 80 megahertz spectrum down to something where you can sample multiple channels at the same time. The hardware uh, might already tell you that you can't use just any weight. Um, for instance, uh, back in the USRP1 or, or some of the later ones, we have certain devices that work right. Um, and some of the later ones are actually arbitrary. Some devices have better quality rates. Uh, again, on the Edis, there's a CIC filter that works best at like, divided by four um, rates. Um, and it'll work with divided by two, which roll off sounds good. The RTL won't work at all at some frequencies, so it'll just lie to you and say it's working or you garbage. So your hardware may um, uh, make up the mind for you. And then you've got performance limits, either on the sampler, uh, your USB bus, like if you're going over USB 2, you find that it can only hold so much, or the computer might not be able to keep up. And then some systems have prescribed rates, LTE, um, very complicated system, but like if you have a 10 megahertz channel, they tell you sample at 15.36 megasamples. So there again, you have to decide. So a little bit on filters. I'm getting close to the end here. So okay, great. Um, so filters are meant to isolate a signal from other signals and noise. Now one man's signal is another man's noise, the other way around. Um, they perform anti-aliasing, as we saw for uh, rate changes. That's important to keep in mind. Uh, the filters in GNU radio can interpolate or decimate. There's usually all kinds, and it's a very efficient process under the hood. So uh, don't do like I did and have a separate uh, stage for that. Use the ones that are built in the filters. If you get these messages with the flow graph and you have a filter, 
Um, take a look at what you're trying to get your filter to do. You'll notice that uh, this filter is trying to do that one mega sample per second, trying to uh, have a 100 hertz roll off. And uh, with the naive implementation to FIR, that's 24 gigaflops just for my filter. My laptop doesn't happen to have that. <laughs> so uh, use filters that are efficient. Uh, use the cheapest filter that does the right job. If you don't need to go off on 100 hertz and 10 kilohertz is fine, do 10 kilohertz. Save your processing from somewhere else in your chain. Downsample as early as possible. Why do operations if you just kind of throw away the answer? So downsample early and upsample late in your flow graph. If you're going to do large rate changes, use multiple stages. And there's a whole technique for figuring this out. I won't go into it. But just know that you don't have to cut down from 100 mega samples per second to uh, 10 kilohertz in one step. And uh, some blocks, this is one to watch for, contain filters even though they don't tell you. They don't tell you so you know what you're looking for. Uh, for example, the PSK DMOD has a root raised cosine RC filter uh, built into it. And if you're operating at a really high sample rate, you might find that this block is taking way more time than you thought. And you might have to implement it yourself from scratch to, uh, to keep that filter from uh, logging down your machine at the expense of not having a filter. So, this is where we turn over to a new radio to questions <laughs> converter. <laughs> Any questions? Great. Thank you. So, in terms of the sample types, uh, what operations should I be concerned of, or what types should I be concerned of, and what types of operations? So when it comes to filters or upsampling or downsampling, I mean, you know, to be efficient, do I want to do, you know, when it's coming in from a user or whatever, uh, hard piece of hardware, what do I want to use, what sample tech when, so I can be most efficient? I, I think that, that's one of those it depends things, so, so maybe I can uh, take a look at some other okay. It just depends on what you're trying to do. <laughs> Yeah, and the it depends often that uh, we didn't get a radio, there will be algorithms that are designed for specific data types. So there's a lot based around, as, as Joe said, a lot based around single precision floats and complex floats, not a whole lot around like complex shorts. And complex shorts make a lot of sense for resolution. And, and speed's actually an interesting thing, sorry, I'm going to take over for a minute here. Because uh, this comes up often in our discussions. Uh, with kind of more traditional hardware radio people, uh, why don't we do fixed rate? processing in radio. Uh, it really turns out that Intel has spent, and like the x86 world has spent a lot of time optimizing their floating point units, that you rarely get any benefit from doing fixed point math because that floating point unit is just really, really good. And so what you're doing is you're giving up the flexibility of the float as far as the dynamic range that it can represent for very little speed up in the, in the, the, the short representation, the fixed point representation itself. Um, so that's why we, we fall back. Most of our algorithms are based around single precision float because of that. Now there is a concern, there is a, an effort to look into uh, fixed point on ARM, where we can do soon the optimization, right? Because if you're going to cut from 32 down to 16 bits, or maybe from the 32 bit float down to an 8 bit uh, character, now you can fit twice or four times as many of those units in your SIMD registers. So you're doing twi two times or maybe four times as much work on that. There might be a benefit there. Um, but we, we haven't actually seen that on Intel-based or x 6 type chips, uh, but we're kind of we're thinking about it as a, maybe a win for the ARM system. But so from a data type perspective, we do tend to, from a sample representation, deal with super precision floats, and that's the reason why. The new radio doesn't have uh, scale that's the same way that, that, like if you're trying to simulate for FPGA work, um, you'd be using scale lanes for efficiency, so it doesn't really matter. Perfect on time, but we can take one more question if. Uh... The 64 bit float, is that used in any box or are there any future applications for very high dynamic range? I haven't seen it used anywhere yet. The only time to use 64 bit uh, floats are double precision floats. The only time to use double precision floats is in the uh, IIR filter, so the infinite uh, uh, impulse response filters. Uh, for that value, the, the TAPS value can be kind of become unstable if you don't have a really high precision uh, um, representation of those TAPS. 
So we do use doubles there. There is a float version, but you have to be careful because you can run that filter unstable. Uh, but the double precision, as much as it's always done good work on making floating point units really fast, double precision, not really. Double precision will slow you down dramatically, both from a memory bandwidth perspective and just the uh, processing unit. Or if you think about it, if, you're, if you follow the GPU trend, GPUs are really good and they have a lot of hardware dedicated to floating point space. Every generation of like NVIDIA um, chipsets, GPUs coming out, have more and more double precision, but it's still like a tenth of what resources they dedicate to single precision. Uh, and as Jeff mentioned, the noise floor, the dynamic range of a uh, single precision flow is roughly like 140 dB. Like you can see that if you actually just, if you just uh, on your radio generate a sine wave and look at it in the, the uh, frequency domain scope and increase the, the resolution of that, you'll actually see a noise signal on the bottom. That's actually the noise of the floating precision number, like the quantization noise of the floating uh, point number. So it's kind of cool to see that. Um, that is so much lower than almost any hardware radio we get our hands on. Like that's that's you know we're we're actually you're approaching thermal limits there as far as what a radio is going to be able to ship you. Um, I mean you can do better, but not much. Uh, so you're so that's like really usually good enough from a to using precision to get the noise the quantization. The quantization of the floating point number will be less than the quantization noise of your radio. So that's why I mean so all those things come into play and why we we said the single precision most. Good. Okay, well, we should move on to the uh, next presentation. Jeff, thanks a lot.